The Best of Living in Iowa is funded in part by the Gilchrist Foundation. Founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Funding for this program was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. Generations of families and friends who feel passionate about the programs they watch on Iowa Public Television. Hello, this is Morgan Halgren. For 16 seasons, Living in Iowa told the tale of what it means to be uniquely Iowan. Tonight, we honor that spirit by bringing you another glimpse into our rich heritage with a few stories from our archives. In this episode of The Best of Living in Iowa, we'll go up a country lane with premier Iowa radio homemaker, Evelyn Birkby. Follow naturalist Lewis Major as he helps us find Iowa's endangered flora and fauna and visit with filmmaker Marlene Booth, who made a film about growing up Jewish in the Hawkeye State. We'll go to Shenandoah, to a time when radio signals were beginning to fill the Iowa skies. Those golden years produced programs of all kinds, but none would be as popular as the radio homemaker shows. Their success appeared like a bolt out of the blue. It's 11.30, and KMA now brings you Evelyn Berkeley with her new program, Up the Country Lane. Good morning, Evelyn. Hello, Jimmy, and hello, folks. I really feel this morning like I, I should be English. I've heard that the English, when they answer the telephone, say, yeah, are you there? And I, I sort of feel instead of saying hello, I should say, are you there? A young woman said to me the other day, she said, you know, Young women still gather together, they sit and drink coffee, they talk about what their children are doing, what they're cooking, the very same things that the radio homemakers talked about from the very beginning. It, it's still that same friendly approach that neighbors have with each other. And that's what happened on the radio. In the 1920s, radio was a new and amazing medium. It covered the countryside and reached into every farm home, no matter how isolated. In Shenandoah, station KFNF was owned by Henry Field and station KMA by Earl May. Both men operated large mail-order seed companies and used the stations to promote their goods. The stations went on the air in the mid-1920s and broadcast live music, news, farm and market reports, and a wide variety of informational talks. The radio homemaker concept came into being when Henry Field put his sisters on the radio with the most popular and longest running show, Kitchen Clatter. Evelyn Birkby, a longtime radio homemaker on Up a Country Lane and Kitchen Clatter, has chronicled the era in a kind of history cookbook about the radio homemakers. Radio homemakers were so welcomed into these far-flung rural homes. And they, women could be out there snowed in in the winter, maybe mudded in in the spring, having much to do in the summer. And here were these women coming in not only as companions and friends, but they were telling them new ways to bake, new recipes to make, how to take care of their children, and, and also encouraging them. If there was one quality I think they all had, it was making people feel that you were just sitting there visiting with them as a personal friend. Nobody else was listening, just you and, and whoever was the radio homemaker talking to you. What was the typical listener like? It was a farmer on a tractor. It was the school teacher in town that listened on Saturdays. Or it was the town woman, a young wife perhaps who was alone with her children. So age probably meant nothing. And a lot of the children listened because their mothers had the radio on. What was a typical broadcast like? Let's say the kitchen clatter. Kitchen clatter covered a half hour. And normally it started with the two people visiting with each other about uh, how things had been going, uh, what they'd been doing. Uh, ju just the common, ordinary things that had been happening. They usually had six or seven commercials. 
So a little of the visit would be broken up with a commercial. And then they might give the recipe for something that used the flavorings and then go into a flavoring commercial. They would talk about some homemaking, household hints, and then go into a commercial for their household cleaning products, which Kitchen Clatter made. So they could weave this in and out. It was, it was kind of a, you, you hardly knew when they went from chat to a commercial, which was one of the great joys of it. At the height of their popularity, there were 14 radio homemakers broadcasting from Shenandoah every week. Today, there's only one. After 42 years as a radio homemaker, Billy Oakley still chats twice each morning with her listeners. I'm not going to tell you about love, not a bit of it. I'm going to talk to you about some other fun things. Hi there, once again, this morning. Hope you have some coffee or something you can sort of cozy up with while we chat this morning. The I can remember I, I had three little kids and they were fairly close in age and I'd, I'd have to yell at this kid and talk to this kid and do something for this one. And all the time I'm thinking, there's something I can tell the girls about tomorrow. You know, it's always in your head. Maybe that's why when I finally did retire for a month and a, two months and a half, it was awful. I couldn't, there's nobody to tell it to. If you found something fun, <laughs> it was yours. Well, it looks to me like it's about time for a weekend. What do you think about it? You're going to have some rain to rejoice over, so have a good time with your rejoicing. And I'll be back with you on the air Monday morning. I hope you'll be with me. Min says the trouble with living it up is that you may have to live it down later. Have fun. Bye-bye now. The radio homemakers and their listeners often acted as a support group for one another, sharing the mundane as well as the momentous events in their lives. I received letters that were just amazing from women that would tell me the problems with their children, the problems with their husbands, the problems with their neighbors, and it was because they felt they knew me. And all of the radio homemakers had listeners who felt this way. We probably knew more about what was going on around the countryside in the lives of people than almost anyone in the territory, except maybe their own neighbors or relatives. No one had ever done this before. There were no radio programs. There were no women on radio. They were speaking to women like themselves that they knew. They were affirming their lives in a time when they did not get very much recognition. Maybe for a, a pecan pie that they took to the church supper, you know, Myrtle makes the very best in the whole world was the kind of recognition that they were getting. And here were these women on radio saying, you're important. What inspired you to write the book? The lives of these women that I knew so well as I was a radio homemaker and began to, through the years, because for over 40 years I had some kind of a contact here, I felt like they were so important that the lives should not be lost, that they contributed pioneers in radio, pioneers in women's careers, pioneers in support groups, the very things that we've been discussing, that it was not going to be very long before these women would be gone. So these are treasures, and these are treasures I wanted to share because I was afraid that someday the days will be over when people will know who these women were. But you know, one of the interesting things is one of the most recent homemakers. When I asked her for a recipe to put in the book, she gave me her grandmother's recipe. And I thought, well, maybe this is significant. Here's this young woman who is cooking like her grandmother did, wants to cook like her grandmother did. Hey, this book is full of how grandmother cooked things. So the era that started and the lifestyles and the stories and the pictures are really a part of what the Midwest has been. If you came to visit us, you wouldn't find a house right smack in the middle of a cornfield. There is a nice lawn around our house, and around the, the green grass is what I call a grove of trees. I don't, I don't know how many trees it takes to make... The state of Iowa has been called one of the most tame states in the country. 
very little of what was once wild and natural still exists among the farm fields and urban development. While there has been some good environmental news lately with animals such as the bald eagle and the river otter returning to the state, naturalist Lewis Major tells us that from the tiniest of insects to the habitats they populate, several of our fellow residents are feeling the pinch of our advances. Check this out. Hocus, pocus, alakazam! All right, well maybe I'm not very good at magic. In the world of magic, it's really cool when things disappear. But when plants and animals begin to disappear, it's anything but cool. We're all familiar with the clear cutting of the rainforest, unrestricted hunting of whales, illegal poaching of elephant ivory, big global issues that have stretched their way all the way to the Midwest, largely in part due to bumper stickers. However, these are not just problems in some far off land. There are several species of plants and animals right here in Iowa that are slowly disappearing. I'd like to introduce you to a few of them before they die off. Tucked away off a lonely blacktop road lies this quiet country cemetery and home to a very unique plant. Yep, cacti in Iowa. A native cacti species, prickly pear were not extensively abundant across Iowa's landscape but present populations have declined. Today, it survives on forgotten hillsides and quiet little cemeteries and other less traveled areas. Native American Indians used the fruit or pear of the cacti as food. Ow, I think I'll pass. Plants and animals go extinct naturally, but human influence and the alteration of the environment has dramatically aided in the decline of some species. This is Sand Hill, a small piece of native prairie that's managed to survive. About 80% of Iowa once looked like this. Today, less than 1% of Iowa prairie remains. Sandhill Prairie gets its name for this unique sandy soil. It's the sandy soil that attracts this little guy, the ornate box turtle. The ornate box turtle is Iowa's only native box turtle, and it depends on the sandy soil for survival. The need for this turtle to burrow requires it to stay in areas that offer easy digging. The ornate box turtle is listed as a threatened species in Iowa, and it's protected by law. But without its habitat, its future is dim. Butterflies are beautiful, but can also give us an idea of the health of this ecosystem. And here to study that relationship is Keith Somerville, Assistant Professor of Environmental Science at Drake University. If you have a lot of different types of butterflies, you've got a healthy system. The butterflies are important to the prairie. How important is the prairie to the butterfly? Well, the, the, the habitat, it's all about the habitat. You need to have a large number of different types of flower species. You need to have the component grasses that make up the dominant vegetation of the, the tall grass prairie. If those pieces aren't put together, kind of like a puzzle, if they're not there, then no matter how hard you try to reintroduce the animals or coax animals to come into the habitat, you're simply not going to be able to get them back or, or they're not going to stay there, you know, even once you release them. We hear a lot about studying the big animals. Why do we study the little things? The larger things are good to study because they give you a sense for how the whole landscape around your preserve is changing in addition to what's happening in your preserve. But if you just solely focus on those larger things, you, you won't see the forest for the trees, so to speak. You'll, you'll miss the fine details in terms of looking at how, how vibrant and how well functioning your, your prairie is. So Keith, what is the overall status of our butterflies in Iowa? There's a lot that we don't know about Iowa butterflies. But I think it's safe to say that there are some species that are probably doing okay. And then there are other species like the Dakota skipper that some people think is actually gone from the state. I have to say that the overall picture for butterflies in the state really depends on our ability to protect places like these and then manage them appropriately. Now the animals that I'm collecting here are not in danger of disappearing. Their habitat is. This is Engeldinger Marsh. Wetlands like this were once common across central and northern Iowa. Today, only a handful remain. This wetland was formed approximately 12 to 14,000 years ago during the retreat of our most recent glacier, making it literally irreplaceable. Wetlands are not just puddles of water. They're vital habitat for a variety of organisms. One scoop of the net, you're looking at six, eight, maybe even 10 different organisms in this wetland. That's called diversity. These aquatic insects, like this predaceous diving beetle, 
These guys have long legs for paddling, compressed streamlined bodies for swimming. Uh, on land, these guys are awkward, but in the water, they're like racing boats. Crayfish, or crawdads. Uh, I like to call them Iowa's lobsters. Uh, they actually crawl across the wetland floor, cleaning up bits and pieces of dead, rotten animals. These are baby dragonflies. They begin their life in the water, but spend their adult life on land. These little white, red-eyed bugs are called back swimmers. They swim upside down. They'll swim underneath an animal and then pierce it with its mouth part and begin to feed. It's like one big giant fang. That pierced my skin and it hurt me. You can imagine what something like that is gonna do to a small frog. And there's thousands upon tens of thousands of these in the water. It's a vicious world in there. When unique habitats like this wetland disappear, it can have devastating impacts on wildlife. This is a Massasauga rattlesnake. These snakes prefer wetland habitat. With only a handful of wetlands remaining, there are only a few Massasauga populations left in the state, making this snake an endangered species. Disappearing habitat is not the only cause for the decline of a species. Illegal wildlife trade has a huge impact on wildlife worldwide. Elephant ivory and hair for bracelets, medicinal powders from things like rhinoceros horn, sea life like walrus tusks, and rare shells, skins from lizards, turtles, alligators, and snakes. These products are illegal. If you travel and purchase these products, it supports the market. And through supply and demand, more animals may be illegally killed. But it's not all gloom and doom. We can and have made a difference. At one time, bald eagles were on the brink of extinction. Today, it's common to see them along Iowa waterways during the winter. By the early 1900s, river otter had vanished from Iowa's interior rivers and streams. Today, they've been reported in every county in the state. I have read experts estimate that 99% of all life that's ever existed on Earth has gone extinct. This represents the 1% that's made it, so far. Most of the time, we focus on saving the feathery or the furry animals, but everything is here for a reason regardless of feathers or fur. An old Native American proverb states, what is man without beast? If all the beasts were gone, man would die from loneliness of spirit. For what happens to the beast happens to the man. When plants and animals begin to disappear, it not only raises concern about the future of the environment, but raises concern about our future as well. This planet does not belong to us. We only share it and we happen to share it with the most awesome diversity of life known to exist. Few people can claim to have made it through adolescence without some degree of concern about fitting in. Tonight we'll look at some inspiring ways that perennial problem plays itself out in people's lives. For many of us, the desire to fit in is so strong that we're willing to spend a lot of energy hiding our differences and Marlene Booth would be the first to agree with that. Since growing up a yiddle, which means a Jewish child, set her apart from her friends, Marlene became secretive about her way of life. It really wasn't easy being a yiddle in the middle. When I was in first grade, I brought my menorah to school at Hanukkah time to tell my friends about Hanukkah. And I lit the candles and said the blessings and felt really terrific about showing off. And then after school, I ran into one of my friends with her big sister. And my friend said to her sister, pointing at me, do you see her? She doesn't believe in Jesus. And both girls went, oh. <gasps> Being Jewish was not for show and tell. More than any other, this scene captures the essence of Des Moines native Marlene Booth's new documentary, Yiddle in the Middle, her story of growing up Jewish in Iowa. As I began to film and think about the issues that interested me, I realized I was very interested in the ways that I felt as though my Judaism stopped at my front door or the front door of my synagogue, or the front door of any Jewish setting, and didn't, didn't continue beyond that. And I wondered about myself. I was clearly censoring in public 
Jewish parts of me, and I wondered why. Where did that come from? Finding the answers to those questions turned out to be the focus of her film. And when the words and images came together, it was clear that the film itself had become a sort of lens, one that sharpened the filmmaker's image of herself. This was a learning process in a way no other film has been. I've, I've produced many other films and thought, this is going to be a cinch. This is my own story. and It'll just sort of come out of me. I mean, I'll finish this one in half an hour. And it ended up becoming, in ways that I could not have predicted, the most difficult film, because I was finding myself acknowledging things I'd only thought but never put into words. To then put them into words and, in fact, go public with them was really very difficult. Uh, but I decided that that was the most honest story that I could tell. Marlene's is the story of a young girl striving for consciousness of self and her realization of how she fit into a community-wide Jewish self-consciousness. I realize now that I lived in two separate worlds. There was the Jewish world at home where we kept kosher and sang Hebrew songs and used Yiddish words. And there was the Iowa world outside. And now give a warm Iowa welcome to the 1996 State Fair Jazz Band. I had an incredible sense of pride and joy in being Jewish. And I just didn't feel as though there was room in the vocabulary of the time to express that without getting weird stares about, what's with you? In 1950s Iowa, I would have been embarrassed to invite my non-Jewish friends to see this. Here's my cousin's cousin, Adrian, putting on tefillin an ancient ritual used in morning prayer. I think Iowans measured us against the Jewish stereotype, loud, pushy, and controlling the banks. We thought New York Jews were loud and pushy, but we were Iowa Jews, cheerful, friendly, and eager to please. I'd seen Julius and Ethel Rosenberg on TV and wondered if we knew them. My mom said they were Jews who did something very bad to our country. She said we had to be nice so people wouldn't think all Jews were like that. If I misbehaved, it would reflect badly both on them and on the whole Jewish community, that I was representing a race and that I needed to keep that in mind when I was in public. But I don't know, where, I don't know when they said that, really. I, I just know that it was in the air that I breathed. The desire to fit in seems to be an unavoidable part of growing up. But for Marlene, the issues were weightier than the right kinds of clothing or the most popular music. What set her apart was her way of life. My house smelled different from the houses of my non-Jewish friends. Their smell of bacon grease left in a tin can on top of the stove. Mine smelled of fried onions and chopped liver, or gribbonus, a Jewish dish made by frying chicken skin with onions. But the snack we loved most was vanilla wafers, plain, sweet, white bread, American food. <laughs> when I celebrated my 12th birthday, I never noticed the way my friends seated themselves. But now I see a pattern. Non-Jewish friends from school on one side, Jewish friends from school on another, and Jewish friends from my synagogue on the third, close to my family. As she reached high school age, Marlene became torn between a conscience that, on the one hand, insisted she speak out, while on the other, resisted making waves. Behind the smiling photos, I was feeling torn in two. I loved being from Iowa, where people were trusting and nice, but I also loved being Jewish, which led me to question and speak out. The civil rights movement was heating up, as was the war in Vietnam. And those were things that touched me deeply and personally and that I wanted to take stands on and wanted to be a part of. And yet, in a certain way, being a polite, uh, go along with things Des Moines kid didn't allow room for that. The pressure of having a Jewish social conscience but being a smiling Iowan was getting to be too great. I felt I couldn't be true to myself and stay in Des Moines. 
When I went to the senior prom with my boyfriend Avi, I hoped I'd have the courage to leave Iowa for good. I just didn't know for where. That desire to leave resulted in a voluntary Des Moines diaspora for Marlene's extended family. All four of her siblings and 21 of 22 of her cousins eventually went on to college and left Iowa. This was the 60s. I think I went in search of a place where I could wear jeans downtown and not have someone call my mother and say, did you know that she wore jeans downtown? No one has done that since I've been in Boston. <laughs> Marlene has been living in Cambridge, Massachusetts for almost 30 years. But she came back recently to share her new film with some Iowa students. Funded in part with seed money provided by Humanities Iowa, Yiddle in the Middle made its Iowa premiere at West High in Iowa City. It's really a privilege for me to do in a certain way what I think might have made a difference for me when I was the age of the groups I'm speaking to. How many of you feel as though you know something about Jews? Yeah. And I think it's wonderful to show it at the high school level because so many people don't have exposure to that at all at high school. And it may be something that they're more exposed to as they go to college and, and the world expands. So to bring something like this in gives kids an opportunity to see a different world that they didn't know existed. It's kind of interesting because I had a group of friends who I pretty much hung out with in junior high and the first couple years of high school who were different from me. Um, and I kind of did the two world thing, I guess you could say. You know, around them I was a completely different person than myself um, just because that was the way I had to fit in with them. But I recently found new friends where that changed and I'm a lot happier now because, you know, I can be my true self with them. So. Um, I guess you can kind of say I feel this joy within myself um, that I don't have to go out of my way to be different anymore. At Red Oaks Middle School, the sixth graders packed the library for Marlene's visit and filled the question and answer session with their curiosity. Yes. Did you have a favorite part of being a Jew in Iowa? It wasn't really until... It'd probably be really hard for her because most of the people that were around are the same as us, same religion and everything. And to be a different religion, it would be pretty hard, though. It was trying to, like, teach us, like, how hard it is to be a different religion or a person that doesn't fit in with the other kids. Kind of made some of us think that they may be trying their hardest to fit in, but sometimes it just doesn't work for them, and they, it, they just get teased all the time. And some people, like, started to understand that they can't tease them because they have feelings, too. Whether brought on by the presence of our television camera, Marlene's visit, or just the coming spring break, the intensity of these middle school students was hard to miss. Uh, yes. Have the people in your workplace ever left you out of the things they do? Because I'm Jewish? You yeah. Mean? No, they haven't. In, in what part, seemed clear was that the film had given them a glimpse of what it was like to have grown up a yiddle in the middle. I think if somebody had come before me and, and raised issues of identity, I don't think I would have come out necessarily, but I think it would have made me feel less isolated. That's about one of the most difficult things for all of us. My hope is that they'll take something home and think about it. The Best of Living in Iowa is funded in part by the Gilchrist Foundation. Founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Funding for this program was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. Generations of families and friends who feel passionate about the programs they watch on Iowa Public Television.